the opening of Dragon Age Origins is pretty hardcore. We start off getting introduced to the main antagonist, the Darkspawn, and we move on to meet a Grey Warden who proceeds to boss root in this guy's ass into a prone position, merc another spawn, then foos roda this other guy's ass off a cliff. Pretty rad. Then you come to the big selling point of the game, and that's the Origins part of Origins. Each character that you make, depending on their origin, will start in a different location under different circumstances, with different challenges associated to the opening. But after the opening moments, that's pretty much it. You go down the same path as every other character origin from there on out, and your origin plays a little role in how you do things. Except in a scant few places, at least as far as I can remember. It's admittedly been a few years since I played through this game. I created a human for this playthrough, as it no longer mattered which race I picked because I've seen every origin in this game play out. I'm going with a two-handed build this time around because they're insanely easy to build. You basically just put points into strength and nothing else. I might be picking up some cunning for the persuasion skill, but that's to be seen. After you pick your background, it's time for sculpting the look of your character, and there's a lot here. At least enough to bring a vague representation of a human. And after that, the final step picking your skills. This is all pretty straightforward. Each skill does something specific. For instance, Shield Bash will stun an opponent, while Pommel Strike knocks an opponent down, leaving them helpless for a time. While other skills make you immune to stun and should be picked up immediately, because getting stunned or knocked down is a sure next step to death for a tank, so we want to make sure that this never happens. One of the unique things about this game, and what I personally like about it best, is that buffs typically are permanent, so long as you have enough stamina to maintain it. Every time you turn a buff on, it reserves a certain amount of your resources like mana or stamina, and so long as you don't use those resources, the buff stays up so you don't have to keep casting it. It's just a quality of life thing from traditional tabletop RPGs that I really enjoy. Armor, on the other hand, which I will be using, does another interesting thing. When you put it on, it provides you with a bonus to your armor stat, and armor will reduce the amount of incoming damage, and incoming damage is reduced by whatever that number of your armor is. But the unique thing that it does is lower the total amount of stamina you have by reserving a piece of it. It starts off very low in the 2% range for leather, but as you scale up into the heavier armors, the strength requirement and the stamina requirement climbs significantly. For instance, low level heavy armor reserves 15%, while tier 9 heavy armor weighs enough to gobble up 36% of your stamina. So it's worth at least thinking about using lighter armor if you're the type of fighter that's going to be using a lot of activated talents. The armor and stamina system adds just the right amount of complexity to a system that is normally straightforward and as a result makes your decision be more about line go up or down. Now on to the story. For generations, your family, the Kuzlans, has stewarded the lands of Hyava, earning the loyalty of your people with justice and temperance. When your country was occupied by the Arlesian Empire, your father and grandfather served the embattled kings of your land. Today, your elder brother takes up House Kuzlan's banner in service to the crown. Not against the men of Orlais, but against the bestial darkspawn rising in the south. I trust then that your troops will be here shortly. I expect they will start arriving tonight, and we can march tomorrow. I apologize for the delay, my lord. As soon as you meet this guy, you know he's gonna betray you, because look at this dude's face. Give him big round ears and a pair of whiskers and you got yourself a rat. This is entirely my fault. No, no. The appearance of the Darkspawn in the South has us all scrambling, doesn't it? I only received the call from the King a few days ago myself. I'll send my eldest off with my men. You and I will ride tomorrow just like the old days. True. But we both had less gray in our hair then. <laughs> Indeed, good one, chap. Sharp wit, that one. The dialogue in this game is generic. Generic, standard high fantasy stuff, which is juxtaposed with the blood-drenched combat and overly serious tone of the story. At least in the opening hour or so of the game, the dialogue did not hold my attention. Your dad tells you that you're in charge of the house while he and your big brother are off fighting. 
and he set you off to find your big brother and let him know to leave without the lord of the house, which, let's just say I got some big problems with that. The most important person in the house is going to stay behind and leave without the protection of his army? I don't understand the thinking behind all this at all. It'd be one thing if people mention how dumb it is, but no one even seems to notice. I mean, even if he had a vanguard of soldiers with him, a few bodyguards, if he met even a fraction of the Darkspawn army, he'd be a dead mother ah! And no one so much as mentions that fact, so instead of us finding our brother like we were asked to, we're off to find our puppy dog. There you are. Your mother told me the town had summoned you, so I didn't want to interrupt. Yes, I saw the Isle arrive. I fear your hound has the kitchens in uproar once again, and is threatening to leave. So you go to the kitchen, fight some rats that your dog sniffed out, and we get this little gem of a piece of dialogue. Giant rats? It's like the start of every bad adventure tale my grandfather used to tell. Now just because you're self-aware doesn't mean you can get away with it. Some of you might be too young to know this, but rats in a larder is one of the oldest cliches in tabletop gaming history. It's almost always the inevitable first encounter for level 1 players. In fact, they did this same stuff in Icewind Dale, except the rats were exchanged for beetles. Baldur's Gate 1 had a section with rats that wasn't the basement of a tavern, and while each of these games did something to change up the formula and subvert your expectations, even if it was just the bare minimum, Dragon Age side, peel back its sack skin off the inner thigh and just straight up use the cliche as it was. Just make a joke out of it and everyone will forget that we phoned this in, but I won't forget. I don't forget anything except to pay my bills and pick my kids up from school. Watch over our sons, husbands and fathers and bring them safely back to us. And bring us some ale and wenches while you're at it. Uh, for the men, of course. Fergus, you would say this in front of your mother? What's a wench? Is that what you pull on to get the bucket out of the well? No, stupid. See, this is what generations of inbreeding get you. A stupid ah! kid. A wench is a wonderful woman who does things for a man for money that no other woman is willing to do. Like your mom does for your dad, but usually better because the wench is more into it. Your mom looks like the type to ah! f*** out of obligation, you know what I mean? See, in a way, Marriage is what happens to good wenches when they're all done having sex. Shortly after this dialogue, you're sent to bed early by your father. <laughs> enough, <laughs> enough. Pup, you'll want to get an early night. You've much to do tomorrow. Damn, Dad, it's still daylight out. <laughs> you wake up in a cold sweat as you hear the sounds of battle outside your door while someone pounds on it to wake you up. My lord! Help me! The castle is under attack! <clears throat> so you're telling me that this castle didn't even leave enough troops behind to defend it? Even though the king and his entire line, aside from one son, are here in the castle? Like, damn! You'd think there'd be some kind of rule against being that stupid and still being called the lord. So you find your way out of the room only to find that your backpack is full of all kinds of special armor and powerful items that you have no business at your level owning. Thus, sort of throwing a large amount of your progression out the window simply because you bought a more expensive version of the game. Or you bought some DLC. It's the silliest thing I've ever seen. Like imagine if Baldur's Gate 1 just gave you Varscona at level 1 just for being alive. Wouldn't that sort of throw the balance out the window of a moving car? Better tuck and roll! Ah! So we fight our way through the streets, cleaning out room after room of soldiers when eventually... There, you both are. I was... Bryce! ...wondering when you would get here. We stumble onto the Lord of the Manor, hiding in the larder of the kitchen like some kind of little bitch, bleeding to death. Long story short, we pledge an oath of violence on Hal. We'll get revenge for what happened to our pappy and our mumsy, if it's the last thing that we do. And we leave our mom and dad behind to die at the hands of Hal's soldiers, or, as is the case for our mom, get used like a flashlight by whatever squad discovers her first. Darling, go with Duncan. You have a better chance to escape without me. That's the second dumbest thing that someone has ever said to me in this game so far. She's a pretty good fighter and she hasn't slowed me down yet. Just got a death wish, I guess. We will be traveling south through the hinterlands to the ruin of Ostagar, on the edges of the Korkari Wilds. The Tevinter Imperium built Ostagar long ago to prevent the Wilders from invading the northern lowlands. It's fitting we make our stand here, 
even if we face a different foe within that forest. So we leave our old life behind to join the Grey Wardens, but joining the Grey Wardens isn't so simple. First, we have to meet up with a wise-cracking anti-hero, Alistair, who is currently having some friendly banner with a mage. But before we do that, let's talk about the town that we end up in. It's less a town than a war camp. Tents pop up from the ground housing soldiers and dignitaries as well as a tent for the royal Bon Jovi himself, the king. Scattered throughout the town will be people we could talk to as well as people we'll be able to recruit later on, like Wynn. Greetings, young man. You are Duncan's newest recruit, are you not? Hmm, young man. I don't like the way she says that, you know what I mean? You're kind of high for an old lady. The mages in this game operate much differently than they do in other high fantasy games. And all these changes they make here are pretty awesome. But when I played this game for the first time, I played as a mage. The thing is, the truth about the mages only becomes clear once you get to the mages circle. And if you start out as a mage, like I did when I first played this game all those years ago, well, it kind of ruins the surprise. So I want you to experience this the way I should have experienced it. I honestly wish I could have wiped my brain of that memory so I could truly experience the fade for the first time when we go to save the circle. It was the one thing that this game did that was truly interesting and unique. What is it now? Haven't Grey Wardens asked more than enough of the circle? I simply came to deliver a message from the revered mother, Sir Mage. She desires your presence. What her reverence desires is of no concern to me. I am busy helping the Grey Wardens, by the King's orders, I might add. Should I have asked her to write a note? Tell her I will not be harassed in this manner. Yes, I was harassing you by delivering a message. Your glibness does you no credit. Here I thought we were getting along so well. I was even going to name one of my children after you. The Grumpy One. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> <Got he> <laughs> Enough. I will speak to the woman if I must. Get out of my way, fool. You know, one good thing about the Blight is how it brings people together. You know him, you love him. It's the snarky space captain of Dragon Age colon Origins. It's Alistair, and I could sit here all day and criticize the game for having another cliche of a character in their game, but dude, let me tell you, Alistair is a breath of fresh air in this game, because the rest of this game is pretty grim dark most of the time, so having this guy break off a little comic relief now and then lightens the mood and brings much needed levity to the game's story. Plus, he's got a pretty decent backstory if you ask him why he had this fight with the mage. With the mage? The circle is here at the king's request, and the Chantry doesn't like that one bit. They just love letting mages know how unwelcome they are. Which puts me in a bit of an awkward position. I was once a Templar. You don't know? Quick version then. The Chantry tries to control mages because they're dangerous. So they keep Templars that train to hunt down and kill apostates. That's what I was being trained as when Duncan recruited me six months ago. I'm sure the revered mother meant it as an insult, sending me as her messenger. And the mage picked right up on that. I never would have agreed to deliver it, but Duncan says we're all to cooperate and get along. Apparently they didn't get the same speech. So Alistair gathers the band together and we meet with Duncan, the Grey Warden, for our first official mission together. The mission is simple. Kill a whole bunch of Darkspawn, get their blood, and retrieve some treaties from a dusty old library. And just like in Baldur's Gate 1, you learn a painful lesson about mages. Never let them live long enough to fire off a spell, because that spell might be Fireball. Basically, the lesson is this. If you see a mage, go after him first. It doesn't matter if he's surrounded by tanks, kill the damage dealer first, then rogues, then fighters. Basically, you want to kill anything that has a way to bypass your defenses and kill you quickly. And the top of the line on damage dealing is a mage. And remember, if a mage is stunned or laying on the ground, he can't cast spells. So make sure to interrupt his spell casting anytime you see him wave his hands in the air. Well, well, what have we here? Are you a vulture, I wonder? 
A scavenger poking amidst a corpse whose bones were long since cleaned? Or merely an intruder? Come into these darkspawn-filled wilds of mine in search of easy prey. I wonder how she fights in that top without the aid of double-sided tape. I mean, there's no way that that top stays up without the aid of magic. Just saying, she's definitely a witch. Morrigan, after much foreplay, tells us that the papers we're looking for can be found with her mother. And eventually, again, after much more foreplay, the witch gives us our papers and we're back on our way to Duncan. Papers and blood in hand to proceed with a joining ritual. But we find out that the joining ritual is not all fun and games, and sometimes, you die. And my question is, why drink the blood at all? If the only power it gives you is the power to detect Darkspawn coming, then why care? Because Alistair's been bragging about his ability to detect Darkspawn, and even then, we're still getting ambushed by them. So what if you can detect them? Who cares if you don't say anything to anyone about them when you detect them? At last, we come to the joining. The Grey Wardens were founded during the First Blight, when humanity stood on the verge of annihilation. So it was that the first Grey Wardens drank of Darkspawn blood and mastered their taint. Yo, look, you don't need to drink their blood to master their taints, okay? You just need to work the balls and shaft better. You know, that's the main attraction, so to speak. What were we talking about? Those who survive the joining become immune to the taint. They're really gonna keep talking about taints. Taint. Jesus, will you shut up about your taint fetish? God damn. Let's go then. I'm anxious to see this joining now. A few moments later. I am sorry, Avith. Ah! I have a wife. A child. Had I known- There is no turning back. No. You asked too much. Damn, that's cold-blooded. It's around this time that I started to notice the animations. Now, I'm not gonna say that they don't look good in combat because they are pretty good. And there's very little downtime. So it looks like a real fight within certain limitations that are understandable given the type of game that this is. But I couldn't shake the feeling that the weapon swings look like they just lacked impact. This is due to a few reasons, I believe. First off, animations look slow and have too many frames between wind up and swing, which makes the overall swing look sluggish and slow. Impactful swings feel impactful because of the speed and force behind each swing. In most action games, for instance, a weapon swing animation will have most of its animation frames cut so that it looks like the weapon was swung in only a few frames, creating the illusion of speed and impact. All of this seems to have been done to eliminate the downtime between attacks, to make the battles and the people participating in those battles seem more active. But look at this windup. If you saw this dude taking this much time to wind up for a swing, would you still stand there to get hit by it? Or would you move out of the way? Sure, it looks more active than, say, Baldur's Gate, where the combatants stand around and wait for their turn, but that's just an illusion, easily shattered given the tiniest bit of thought. Then we come to the animations for facial expressions, and let's just say they make my face tired and move on. Bioware has never excelled at this type of animation, so it's a safe bet that they probably never will. I cannot wait for that glorious moment. The Grey Wardens battle beside the King of Ferelden to stem the tide of evil. Yes, Kaelin. A glorious moment for us all. Hey, wait a minute. That guy just smirked for no reason. Why is he doing that? I don't think we should trust this guy, fellas. After the big joining ritual, you are tasked with being the guy who lights the beacon. Of course, Alistair protests because he's a big tough guy with a tiny peen and feels perpetual need to prove that it's not small. It's average size. Anything bigger is just a waste of blood-filled capillaries. You don't understand. The plan will work, your majesty. Of course it will. Sound the retreat. <laughs> The plan will work, your majesty. Of course it will. Oops. <laughs> Duncan and the king are killed because Loghain decided to leave them without reinforcements, and because of this, everyone dies. Including you. But also not you, because you somehow are saved by Morrigan and her mother, even though the whole town was overrun with Darkspawn. And not only did they manage to save us, but they also managed to secret us out of the tower without being seen or overrun. Now, I have no idea how she did it because even Flemeth is afraid of the Darkspawn hordes. But don't worry about that, though. It happened off screen for a reason. Don't question it. 
Let's talk about tactic slots. Tactic slots are a lot like the Gambit system of Final Fantasy XII, and they are unfortunately necessary due to how the combat works in this game. See, the combat is not as simple, yet also not as complex as it is in a game like Baldur's Gate, for instance. In Baldur's Gate, the only people on the battlefield you needed to manage were your spellcasters, both Divine and Arcane. The reason being, melee and range classes are simply point-and-click affairs. You buff them and send them off to do their thing, and they do their thing pretty reliably, most of the time. But in Dragon Age, the game leans very heavily into micromanagey territory by giving the melee classes a suite of skills that are absolutely pivotal to surviving some of these fights, and as a result, without having tactic slots, you'd find yourself having to manage each turn four different characters' abilities, switching back and forth often in order to manage the chaos ensuing in each fight. Other games like Knights of the Old Republic manage this by making you only manage three characters as opposed to four or five, and you had the ability to queue actions in the game, so typically you only needed to manage the combatants once every handful of rounds, unless something terrible went down. This game instead utilizes a gambit system that checks a variable to see if it's over or under, and then executes a skill. It's quite a good system and comes in handy for mages who are set to heal because in later fights, you'll be healing and you'll be healing a lot. So it's nice to have to not keep pausing combat every couple of rounds to have Wynn heal Alistair for the 15th time. And while we're on the topic of combat, there is a distinct lack of enemy variety in the game. This is not a D&D property, so you won't be seeing the game pulling from a huge codex of D&D monsters. You've got about three different types of enemies. Human enemies, Darkspawn, and demons, and all their minions lumped in with them. There are other types like werewolves, treants, but the variety is short-lived. But if you really think about it, there's really only two different types of enemies because Darkspawn are essentially just human enemies that have been reskinned. Same with a lot of the demon enemy minions as they pull from the same bag of tricks. So the game suffers from a distinct lack of variety in enemy types, which means there's also, by necessity, a lack of tactics to be employed to deal with them. So whatever techniques you use to defeat enemies in the early game will be the same techniques you deploy to defeat the late game enemies. It makes the combat feel shallow and uninteresting by hour 15 of this 40 hour game. And let's talk about tactics you use in a game. Here's what you do. Enemies appear on the screen, you pause the game, scan for the mages in the group, rush and focus the mages, then clean up the rest. How long can you repeat this tactic on the few enemy types you fight before you get tired of that shit? After the battle concludes and you take several arrows to your tender bits, you wake up with Morgan and her fine ass breasticulars hanging out of her low slung top. She tells you that Alistair's been crying all night and is waiting for you outside. When you get outside, Alistair's out there staring out into the water, contemplating a life after Duncan. It's decided after much humming and hawing that the best course of action to take is to get those papers we retrieve from Flemeth and use those treaties to demand an army from the various co-signers, and as a prize, we get to keep Morrigan. Now that you mention it, I do have one more thing to offer. The stew is bubbling, mother dear. Shall we have two guests for the eve? Or none? The Grey Wardens are leaving shortly, girl. And you will be joining them. Such a shame. What? You heard me, girl. The last time I looked, you had ears. <laughs> but before we can go anywhere, we must stop off at the nearest town and restock on supplies and fill that EXP bar a few times. And I expect each of you to supply these men. We must rebuild what was lost at Ostagar, and quickly. There are those who would take advantage of our weakened state if we let them. We must defeat this Darkspawn incursion, but we must do so sensibly and without hesitation. Before we get started, I wanted to make special mention of Terran Loghain and his motivations. Loghain wants what the King wanted, and that's to defeat the Darkspawn. But where the King would invite a kingdom that once enslaved their kingdom to push back the incursion, Loghain wants nothing to do with them. He believes that giving the Orlesians a reason to step foot into their kingdom is all the reason they need to occupy their land once again. Everything that Loghain does is to protect the kingdom, and this makes him much more than just a mustache-twirling villain. 
he ends up being a well-rounded antagonist with sympathetic motivations. And he's a constant threat throughout the game, even though he doesn't appear personally to screw you over, he does it from afar. Like screwing over the mages in the tower, the Arl in Red Cliff, at every turn, Loghain has done something that will slow you up and minimize your progress because you want the same thing that he does and therefore you come into conflict with one another. You both want to be the hero of Ferelden. It's worth mentioning because typically Bioware hasn't been very good at this in the past, but Dragon Age is the turning point. The point where their villains had motivations other than to destroy the world, and it's refreshing, which is why I mention it. Loghain is definitely a highlight in the game. And the voice acting is something truly to behold. Every voice actor's voice is so layered with personality, and the voice direction is fantastic. Even the bit players get a chance to shine thanks to the fantastic direction and the talent behind it. For instance, did you know that Tim Curry voices Arl Hal? Because I sure as hell didn't know that. That's insane. Then we got Claudia Black, you know, the super hot lady from that sci-fi show. She's playing Morrigan, and we got Steve Blum voicing three different people because of course he is. Lots of talent on display, and I can't praise it enough without coming off with a mumbly mouth because it's jam full of Bioware's ah! Lothering is the first real town you visit in the game, and it apparently is on the verge of collapsing under the massive weight of like 10 refugees, and to make things worse, there are bandits and darkspawn blocking the bridges in and out of the place. So my question is, being the pedantic clown that I am, how are all these refugees pouring in if bandits attack you every time you don't have enough money to pay the toll? That's a minor gripe that I'm sure someone who missed the point of these videos will point out in the comments. There's a ton of little side quests to do in this town, but only a tiny little landmass to do it in, so the game does this thing where it has you do one set of side quests first, and then you go out and kill a bunch of guys, come back, turn the mission in, only to find that there's more enemies, more bears, and wolves this time, respawn in the same place as the bandits that you just killed. Now, I've always espoused my love for reusing old content and making it new again. Gothic 2 did a great job with that, but this is the bad kind of reusing, the lazy kind, and in general, I'm not a huge fan of this side content in this game because it's flat and generally one note. Go here, kill a thing, come back, get a reward. It's not why I play RPGs. After grinding out all the boring side content and finding the two companions available here, I go to the bridge and exit the map, and there's some darkspawn here, harassing a couple of dwarves. I try to kill them, and the game auto-crashes on me. If that wasn't bad enough, this is also how I found out that the autosave system in the game is friggin' awful. I got set all the way back from before I started clearing the side missions, so I had to do all those side missions a second time. I went back to fight the darkspawn again, and it crashed a second time. It was only on the third try that I managed to get through the fight without the game crashing the desktop. Lothering feels like a pointless distraction in this game because yes, there's a refugee crisis that we don't really see. Sure, we find out Loghain has put a bounty on our heads, but we find that out no matter what. What purpose in reality does Lothering serve aside from injecting us with pure, uncut EXP with pointless side quests? I call them pointless because after you leave Lothering, everyone friggin' dies at a darkspawn. So, Nothing you do helps, and nothing you do saves anyone because they're all doomed to die at the hands of the coming horde. It's just a pointless distraction there to pad out the runtime. Once you leave Lothering, you're treated to a scene where a one-armed dragon is doing a TED talk for a horde of Dark Swan, and you're dumped into your campsite. And this is when you get to participate in hot companion-on-companion -companion dialogue. You have two romance options and a whole lot of dialogue to explore. For the most part, all of this dialogue is fitting to each character and really serves to flesh them out in unexpected ways. And the thing I have always enjoyed about Bioware games is the depth of those characters. They lean on character traits, quirks, and other easily identifiables, and the characters become much more likable because of it. They remind you of real people while not being boring like real people. If you choose the right dialogue options, you get a little heart icon appearing on the screen which indicates that this character now likes you a little more, and because they like you more, they might even get a boost to their stats at each milestone. Or, if you're really lucky, they might let you bury your tunnel snake in their hidey hole. Tunnel snakes rule. But I think that some of our companions might have some non-normative things going on inside the old noggin. Not that I did not have trouble. There are things about human society which have always puzzled me, such as the touching. Why all the touching for a simple greeting? To begin with, yes. What is the point of touching my hand? I find it an offensive intrusion. There were many nuances that Flemeth could never tell me of. When to look into another's eyes. 
how to eat at a table, how to bargain without offending, none of these things I knew. I still do not understand it all, truth be told, but then I gave up long ago any hope of doing so. Yeah, I feel you, darling. And while all this character stuff is super interesting and is probably the best thing about the game, Liliana is probably the weakest character among them all, and I find that I'm unable to comprehend sometimes why she's so mad. And I want two men stationed within sight of the doors at all times. Do not open the doors without my express consent. Is that clear? Yes, sir. The doors are barred. Are they keeping people out or in? When we arrive at the mage's circle, everything's in disarray. The Templars are panicking, the mages are dying, and the whole place is overrun with demons. The head Templar is about to call for the Rite of Annulment, which is basically a big magical nuke that'll kill every mage in a tower. And this is where we come in, because we need those mages alive to help fight the Darkspawn, but we ain't gonna get no mages if there's no mages left to save. And this is where we find Wynn. And Wynn is cool because she's a resident healer. And she's a damn good one too. Up to now we've been getting away without healing, but from here on out that's going to be a lot harder to do. So Wynn provides our front line with much more survivability. And the less our front line have to take a nap, the less injury kits we have to use on them. Some of the battles in this section are pretty cool. For instance, there are times when you'll be fighting corpses and then a mage will bust into the room by kicking in a door and blast your ass with a fireball. But after a reload and a second try, Unless you wear water wings while you eat soup, you'll pick up on the gimmick pretty quickly and head over to the mage first to kill him and then worry about the rest of the mobs later. The game really only has one crutch to lean on and it gets old super quick. Basically, whoever is capable of hitting you with a fireball, that guy needs to die first. But why? Aren't you tired of all the violence in this world? I know I am. Wouldn't you like to just lay down and Forget about all this. Leave it all behind. The demons are pretty nice in this game, mainly because of how they frame the sloth demon. They frame him as a threat which incapacitates you and sends you to the shadow realm. He's a threat because of the framing. For an example of this kind of framing, think of a succubus, right? There's a bunch of different ways that games handle succubuses, but it normally ends up in the category of dangerous single enemy or minor enemy groups. Either way, you'll be fighting them rather than resisting their temptations, which is what they're all about. Imagine wandering through a cave and coming into a room finely decorated, adorned with rugs and fine scents, and on a raised platform in the back of the tunnel is a bed. And on that bed is the finest looking lady you've ever seen, completely naked, beckoning you forth with a single outstretched finger. And what you don't know is that you're already under the charming effects of the succubus, and you will never emerge from that cave alive again unless you resist the effects of her charm. That's what I mean by framing. Baldur's Gate 3 does this really well when you meet the Cambion for the first time. He's not just a low-level enemy that groups can beat on, he's an event. Your first encounter with the devil, and he's ready to make a deal with you. Now that's framing. In other words, it makes the enemy you're about to face seem more threatening and important than they really are, and I appreciate that. This is one of the few times this game does something totally unique and totally friggin' cool, and I just wanted to mention it properly. But again, I need to talk to you about combat because it wore on me pretty bad at this point. See, this is the Fade, and you would think that the Nightmare Realm of Demons would have all kinds of neat creatures for you to fight, but no, nah, not really. You don't do any of that. You fight human enemies, darkspawn, undead creatures, and generic demons. And I call them generic because fighting them isn't an event. You fight them because you walk into a room that you haven't explored yet and the game doesn't want you going five minutes without a hit of the old crack rock. They're the same shit that you'll be fighting throughout the rest of the game and it feels bad given the context of the sloth demon. Like why am I blowing through all these demons like snot through a Kleenex when the sloth demon handed me my ass like I was a baby in a mud wrestling competition? You might be asking yourself, how do you fight them? Does that change at all? And not really. See, you get access to different skill sets due to the various forms you could change into, and this gimmick is pretty fun to play around with at first, but it very quickly becomes a game of how quickly can I get off my fireball? Basically, the answer to almost all of the problems in the fate is a fireball. Before you do any of that, however, you meet a guy named Nial, and this is when I realized that, for the most part, interactions with minor NPCs, of which there are a lot, don't have many role-playing choices in them. You get three choices, and each of those three choices not only mean the same thing, only slightly different, but they also elicit the same response from the NPC most of the time. 
which is puzzling because the dialogue for companions is all so well done that the generic NPC dialogue starts to stand out like a kid getting his first spontaneous boner. Role playing is only as good as the choices we have to express ourselves and three different flavors of no thanks is not what I would call meaningful dialogue choice. I know they did this the same on the voice acting budget, but that doesn't excuse it. So you spend your time in this level trying to figure your way out of the puzzle islands using your various forms to bypass obstacles, and it all accumulates in a fight with a big bad who will take on various forms that force you, sort of, to change into different forms yourself to beat him. He's a fairly easy fight, and quite disappointing to be honest, given the build up to him, but he's not the main attraction. Later on in the tower you'll encounter a Templar who's being shielded inside of a protective barrier. He'll urge you to kill all the mages, but if you do that, Wynn will flip her friggin' wig and try to kill you. And some of the dialogue here is a little misleading. I mean, when I say I'll take care of those pesky mages, which ones am I talking about? Oh, all of them, Never mind. When would I say that? Oh, by the way, King Merrick had sex with a servant and she produced a bastard son. That's me. Redcliffe is my favorite section in this game because it has a lot of layers to it and it provides you with a lot of role playing opportunities as well. It's multi-tiered and has a lot of phases because there's a lot of problems to tackle in this section of the game. For instance, you have two main problems. There's constant attacks happening from undead that pour out of the castle every night and the Arl has fallen ill. But once you get further into the mission, you discover a third problem, which is the cause of the undead situation. But we'll get into that in a minute. The setup of this mission is wonderful, probably the best mission in the game. When we arrive in Redcliffe, we're tasked with a seemingly simple set of tasks, convince the blacksmith to repair the townsfolk's equipment, and convince the knights to help. But as you do these tasks, other small subtasks open up, like rescuing the blacksmith's daughter and getting a blessing for the knights. And each of these tasks gives you a nice little moment of role playing. I know it's all for flavor, but flavor is what makes the stew stand out. Then as you explore the dungeon of Redcliffe Castle, you find Jowen, an apostate and Maleficar from the Mage's Circle. You find out that he poisoned the Arl and is being imprisoned. And it's here that you find out that the Arl's son has been possessed by a demon. But Jowen insists that he isn't responsible for that, and that he only poisoned the Arl. Then you're given another choice. Leave him locked up, or set him free and hope that he's telling the truth, and that he will, in fact, help you solve the issues at Redcliffe. Then you arrive in Redcliffe to see this. I don't have much to say about this, but just listen to it. It feels like there needs to be like several more layers of sound here. Maybe some music to set the mood and at least some grunts and cheers from Connor. I mean, something to make the scene feel more alive, but instead there's just nothing. It's just so friggin' weird. Then after Connor stops monologuing, we're forced into a fight with Tegan, and apparently getting sliced in half by a greatsword is not as deadly as it would seem, and all he needed was a few deadly wounds to knock some sense into his dumb ass. Oh, Tegan, are you alright? I am... better now, I think. After all this, we're presented with a choice. If we kill Connor, our group members will be pissed, as well as his old, and there's no mention of Connor in the epilogue either, you know, since he's dead and all. A similar thing will happen if you allow the Arlesa to sacrifice herself to save her child, but if you choose to do the noble thing, you have to go to the mage's circle, free them, and the first enchanter has to survive, or you can't pull Connor out of the fade. It's just so damn good and intertwined and is a fine example of what Bioware used to be capable of. It's one of the finest examples of role playing I have seen in a video game and it was like this for a lot of Bioware titles around this time. Dragon Age was a natural evolution of the kind of deep role playing mechanics the team had created with the first Mass Effect. In the final fight with the demon that's occupied Connor, you're forced to pick a mage to go into the fade and exercise the demon that has possessed him. But if you pick Jowen as your dude, it's very likely that you're going to have a bad time. Jowen is the physical equivalent of diarrhea in a paper bag. Monster attacks go right through him and tear him to pieces, spilling his insides out all over the carpet. Not to mention he had very little in the way of defense, but what he did have was a pair of legs and drain life. So, you end up having to Benny Hill these assholes around the arena while hitting them with drain life to keep you alive long enough to kill the demons. And it's frustrating that it had to end this way. It makes the final climax of the whole scenario a bit stupid. Yeah, that's the word for it. 
After Connor is freed from the grips of the titty demon, we come to the final task of this string of tasks, and that's to find a cure for all Eamon's affliction. And apparently, the only thing that can cure the poison is the urn of sacred ashes. The last person who knew anything about the urn is in Denerim, so I head over there and we're treated to a cutscene. Sire, I have more news. Um, yes. Well, it seems that the fighting has gone Enough. exactly as you... I would like to know what you intend to accomplish, Father. Should we not be fighting the Darkspawn instead of each other? The nobility should be brought into line and then the Darkspawn defeated. This is no true blight, Anora. Only Kalen's vanity demanded it be so. Beg pardon, sire. But blight or no, we may not have the manpower to face the Darkspawn suit. Kalen approached your legions for support, did he Never! not? Marek and I drove those bastards out! Not roll out the welcome for them now! We need help, Father. We cannot deal with this crisis alone. Ferelden will stand on its own! I will lead it through this, Anora. You must have faith in me. Did you kill Kalen? Kalen's death was his own doing. I love his motivations and I love his pathology. No evil man ever thinks he's evil and because he fits this well-worn archetype so well, his character is believable. He's the strongest antagonist I think that Bioware has had since John Irenicus. He might even be a little better than John, as crazy as that may sound. He's so blinded by his hatred of the Orlesians that he's willing to sacrifice the kingdom rather than allow them to set foot in it again even to provide help. Denerim is a weird ass place. You come here, walk around, and find out that you only have access to the market district and the pussy palace, and then when you want to try and leave, you can't. When you go to the exit of the area that you're in, you'll be presented with a map of the city, but with no gate out of it like BG2 or an icon to exit. I wandered around the city looking for a way out for about 30 minutes before I went online and found a post about it here. See this button here? These switch between the local map and a world map, but the world map defaults to showing you the city. What you're supposed to do is hit the icon a second time and that will show you the actual world map. Couldn't they have just made a second icon? I mean, I wasted half an hour of my life, and I'm old, I can't be doing shit like that. I don't know. All I discovered from going through his research was that he was staying at the inn. Y yes of course he told me, but I also went through his things to see if I could find other clues to his whereabouts. That's n not true. I told you everything I know. Brother Ginny TV told us, t told me about the inn and that's all. Us? I mean me! There is no us! Bah! Why do I keep up this charade? I gave you a chance to turn aside and forget you ever heard of Genitivi and the Urn, but you persisted. Now it has come to this. And just they forgive me, I do this in your name. Ah, so the plot thickens. You kill Wayland Smithers and find out that Genitivi already left to look for the urn in a place called Haven on the other side of the damn map. All the knights that have been looking for the urn either met their end at Genitivi's house or met their end in Haven. We could just let the Arl die and continue our mission. And that means Tegan would take over duties of smashing this puss if he hadn't already because let's face it, those two are banging. I think we can all agree on that. So it's off to kill some wacky cult and find the sacred ashes. We arrive after many ambush attempts at Haven. We're greeted by a guard whose job seems to be to keep people out, and the first house we stumble into, in fact, the only house we can enter, had a bloody altar in the middle of it where a body was recently sacrificed. Oakley dokley! Then what do you think happens after discovering that? Do you think we get to have an interesting dialogue with guard that spirals out into a mission to find the cult member who did this, only to find out that the entire town is a cult? And they've been giving you the runaround? Followed by an intense battle with the entire town? No, you don't do any of that. No, you walk through a door and the town is now aggro and ready to kill you. The game just cannot wait to throw combat at you, and why not? It's easier to throw enemies at you than to have interesting stories unfold. It's around this time that the constant monster closets really started to get to me. This is a very typical kind of Bioware thing to do. Open a door, monsters inside. Kill the monsters, open the next door, more monsters. And aside from looting and killing, there's very little to do in these dungeons and missions aside from whatever side quest you might have gotten or what little dialogue the game offers in those locations, which is usually very little. 
But it didn't always used to be this way. There was a time when Bioware designed dungeons like real pen and paper dungeons complete with puzzles and other ways to interact with the content aside from mindless killing. Take the Shadow Lord's dungeon from Baldur's Gate 2 for a great example of what these dungeons could have been. Tons of puzzles, mysteries to unlock, even a riddle or two. Plus an optional item that allows you to either bypass the dragon fight or use the item to get the drop on the dragon. Either way, great use of space, great design, it is everything that Dragon Age dungeons are not. So it's around this time that I'm dragon ass. I was in the middle of packing up the house to move, and every time I had to boot this game up, I would have to sit and fight with myself to get back into it. In order to continue with the game, I required some altering of my mind. So every day before I start recording, I meditate. Or I choke myself out until I nearly pass out. Either way, mind altered. And just a quick aside about the Darkspawn, I've been thinking about them a lot lately as I've played through this game and I have an idea about why they bore me so much. The Darkspawn are the least interesting group in the entire game and you spend about half the time fighting them. You never speak to one, which is fine, they are a mindless horde of creatures, but because they're mindless and get no chance to help us understand their motivations, they come off as villains of the week. They're one-dimensional because of it, which is a shame because they are the whole reason the goddamn story starts in the first place. So I guess what I'm saying is, I think that the reason these things are so one-dimensional is because they can't speak. So if you want one-dimensional villains, make it so they can't speak. Do you wonder if you spout only platitudes burned into your mind in the distant past? Then we come to the Gauntlet, an area within the area that you go to to find the Urn of Sacred Ashes. The pacing of this area is great. There's hardly any fights once you get to the Gauntlet, and the fights that are there are unique and actually interesting. The lore we get to learn about Iandraste is well delivered in bite-sized chunks, so it's easily digestible. And I love how it's delivered. The smallest lark could carry it, while a strong man might not. Of what do I speak? You get to hear someone tell you a riddle, and you have to think through the riddle and engage with it on a deeper level than you might have to if it was just dialogue, and because of this, I learned more about Andraste in these few short minutes than I did from any of the books that I read. Then we have to decide something at the end of this mission which is a trope repeated throughout the game. You fight to the end of a dungeon, and at the end you get to make a decision that decides the fate of the people involved with the story at the time. There's usually two choices, a good choice that has a bad net outcome, or a bad choice that has a good net outcome. Here we have to decide if it's a good idea to let TV leave with the location of the urn. If we let him live, he'll go out and tell everyone about the location of the urn, which means every Tom, Dick, and Harry could come here and use the urn for their own selfish needs. Or someone could come here and steal the urn. Are you insane? You didn't have to do that. You may have your reasons for wanting to keep the urn a secret, but I sincerely doubt they were worth the life of this good man. So I stabbed the fool in his back. An innocent man has to die to protect the ashes from the folly of your average Joe Sixpack. This section of the game is mostly combat. You run a gauntlet of enemies through a dungeon of some sort, loot some items, and find some books strewn about to give you some lore. And after all the combat on your way to your objective, you get a small story bit that allows you to make some choice. But up until that point, it's sort of lean on story, but leans heavily on combat. And because the combat felt kind of dull, the only thing I looked forward to were the story cutscenes. That's not to say that all the combat is boring. Some of it is quite good, like the demon in the teleportation circles. When the game gets creative with its combat, that's when it really is good. It's just a shame that it rarely tries anything other than throwing different combos at enemies at you. The story with the forest spirit and the elves stood out in that regard, as did the Redcliffe storyline. I remember these stories even though it's been years since I played it. But going into the Dwarven storyline, I couldn't remember anything except endless tunnels and a million darkspawn. First the general has you fight in his name at the Proving, then he has you crush the Carta. And after all that screwing around, he tells you that if you find Paragon Branca and have her swear allegiance to him, nothing else would matter. So long story short, you wasted my damn time. Not to mention that she's higher in rank than the council and can essentially elect a king. Doesn't that make her a higher rank than the king? It's a strange way to structure a government. The combat is at its most annoying when it goes from room to room combat to ambushes in nearly every single room. 
And at this point, the game leans on throwing a million enemies at you per room with its ambush points in each room where enemies spawn in. And it's challenging, granted, but more a challenge of drawing in enemies to other rooms, separating them from the groups who stand statically waiting for you to enter their kill box. I actually quit the game right around here and was gonna announce that the video was canceled, <laughs> but after much self-reflection, I decided to keep going. I wasn't gonna let this game beat me. And in the end, I'm kinda glad I did. I wouldn't say getting to the end of the mission in the mines was worth all that combat, but it was a nice sequence of events that had a nice twist, and had the same exact patterns as the missions before it. Keep an evil anvil and risk the dwarves turning people into golems, or do the right thing and have a weaker army because of it. Denerum is the very best part of the game from a role-playing standpoint. Very satisfying to tell off Hal and threaten low game, but the game crashes constantly. I had at least 10 crashed to desktops in one playthrough, and each one set me back to an earlier save. And when it wasn't doing that, the graphics were glitching out. This game doesn't run well on Windows 11. You get eventually to a point where you are tasked with freeing Anora, the queen, from Hal's guest room. And after much annoying fighting, you run into a whole squad of people you can't possibly kill. And your only choice is to either attack the army or expose the truth of why you're there. Then this ah! betrays us, and when asked to explain why, she's like, no time, no time, and we're just gonna accept that. Then she tells us that she sold us out because we exposed who she was to her father's most trusted soldier. So she sold us out so she could escape during the fight. And we're just gonna have to accept that because we can't really punch her in the face. Aside from that, this is by far the strongest section in the game, save for the ah! with the combat, which I am so thoroughly tired of at this point. Then you get to the end and the very last decision you get to make. The final scene is a very satisfying conclusion to the game and almost makes the journey up to now worth all the shit you had to go through to get there. You have to make a decision. Either let Alistair kill Loghain or lose Alistair and gain a companion in Loghain, which is a serious plot twist, I'll tell you that. Or let him kill Loghain, blowing a chance at a marriage between himself and Alora. And the dialogue here is very well crafted and the whole idea of the game ending on a debate is such a good idea that, well, I kind of wish it would have just ended on that note, but unfortunately you still have to fight a dragon. The entire game was a slog to get through, and I wouldn't recommend it to people coming from a game like Baldur's Gate. The combat is tedious and made me quit this video multiple times. Like every time I came to a room that had 10 people inside of it that I had to kill, I considered scrapping the video which was about 8,000 words at the time. That's two weeks of work I was willing to just give up on. And it's times like this where I wonder if I'm completely out of touch with reality, especially when I go online and see the reviews for this game are glowing. That people liked this game back when it came out and they like it now, but I wonder how many people actually revisited this game in the current year and how many of those people walked away feeling the same way about it as they did when they first played it. Why don't you leave a comment below and tell me about your experience with the game, both recent and in the past. And while you're there, give the video a thumbs up and subscribe if you like this content and want more. And this has been a rant from Strategy, and now that you heard it, go play some games.